some problems for them. And Derek, the Chinese uh, uh, premier now, of course, is talking about clamping down on prices uh, internally, including agricultural prices. Uh, what's the fallout from that likely to be? It's a big picture uh, debate. That. That's a very big question. When you're actually controlling your currency um, and you're creating massive surpluses the way they are, one of the spillovers from that is that you start with commodity price increases, you start to get prices increasing around the economy. And so they're moving to price control to try and stop that. So it's a bit like putting your finger in a dam. This is coming out, so this bit starts to move, so that bit starts to move. And so in a command economy, it's very difficult to pick the right prices to control. And if you control prices too badly, which is what they're talking about doing, you start to get shortages. And when you start to get shortages, you start to get rationing. And that's the road that Russia went on ultimately before things fell apart. So it's not a good sign that they're going to price control. Not at all, I don't think. What would the ramifications be for the rest of the world? Uh, well, I'm not sure that it'll actually have much, much effect on, f on free markets in the rest of the world in terms of the fact that some of the, the prices in food, wheat, corn, uh, even rubber have gone up enormously in the last six months. And that's just a factor of demand. So that's the price. And you can't really control it in the long run. Chris, what's your take on the China situation? Well, the logical solution to the, uh, the inflation that's coming through with commodity prices is to let their exchange rate appreciate at a, at a quicker rate, which, gives the, which will lower the commodity prices in their economy. Uh, they're not so interested in that because they, they want their export sector to continue to fire along at this artificially low exchange rate. But uh, you know, a lower growth rate should still achieve what they want to achieve. Um, but hopefully without quite so much inflation. But they, you know, they're targeting growth around the 8 9% mark. They've been growing over 10% at some stages. Uh, but once they start to get down below that, those high growth rates, uh, they start to have um, problems of people leaving the rural sectors, coming to the city, and there being no jobs for them. So it's a, it's a fine machine to uh, have to try and manage, and uh, I agree with Derek, when you start controlling this price and that price, you run the risk of going uh, horribly astray. It sounds a little bit like the way we tried to run our economy in the, uh, in the 70s, only worse. And uh, I think that uh, the first thing to do is let the exchange rate appreciate just a little bit faster to try and um, get a little bit more balance there. With the GFC, Global Financial Crisis, Derek, uh, it seems to me that everybody from the man on the street to the most sophisticated economists now understand more than ever we live in a very small village. We are all interconnected. Uh, and I notice that there are trade talks carrying on this week in Auckland for the Trans-Pacific deal. Uh, and the two big players who want to come on board that, Australia and the United States. But are we ever going to get a better deal with a partner like the United States? Uh, let's talk about that. Yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, there's enormous lobby groups in the United States, particularly in the agricultural sector, that are not going to allow Huge. the kind of deal that we want. Yes. But this is interesting in that the way that the, this TPP sort of started and America started to get interested in it and then Australia, and it's starting to get the heavyweights on and even Japan's talking about wanting to have a closer look at it with the, uh, uh, the Japanese Prime Minister being involved. So I think it's actually got, it's got some legs. But the devil's going to be in the detail and uh, working through some of those issues is going to be very, very difficult because that, that American protectionist group, getting back to what you were saying, America's got to wake up that the rest of the world is actually moving on without them. And uh, if they don't actually join it, uh, then they're going to be left behind. Yeah. yeah. Chris, what's your take on it? I think Derek's, Derek's spot on. The, uh, the devil is in the detail. I mean, recall that when we're talking about a free trade agreement with the states, you know, we think our dairy industry is pretty lean and mean, and they, they come up and, and, and start knocking it and uh, you know, s speaking about um, how Fonterra is a monopoly player and can influence the market and that's unfair and all those sorts of things. So um, I sometimes think with the states you've just got to keep your head down um, and I certainly have more faith in the, uh, the ability for us to grow our exports up in Asia than I do in the, do in the States. The States is a, is a, it's got the world's biggest pool of consumers and it's our, one of our biggest trading partners, but Asia's where the growth's going to be. And, and uh, I think Derek's right saying that the world's marching on without the, the, without the States. So I'm more interested in how we can trade with, uh, with, with Asia and the growth that we can achieve up there. And yet, uh, whether it's China or the United States, we're still talking about superpowers, and we're a very tiny little country. Are we ever going to get the best deal in a situation like that? Derek? 
No, probably not. We're not, are we? I mean, you look at the Australian <laughs> uh, deal that they did, they thought they had a pretty good deal and it, it, uh, the devil again was in the detail. So, uh, I mean, at the end of the day, I'd rather actually be pushing a deal like this than not. So it's, it's opening doors and it does lead to things that you don't think about at the time. So discussion is always good. Where it leads, we'll just have to see. Yeah, and, and, and many critics say, OK, maybe it's not just about exports now. Maybe we have to think about these deals in terms of investment strategy, strategic alliances. Uh, does that make sense to you, Chris? Well, we're a small, very open economy, so we have to talk about all of those things, so be it be it trade or capital flows, and uh, you know, as a as a as a broader picture, as long as we um, don't have great savings here, like we were talking about before, um, we're we're just hugely reliant on interacting with uh, with economies. So. Uh, uh, we have to be, we have to be at the table for these sorts of talks. Here's maybe a dumb question: Does free trade always give you the best deal? Well, that's the debate, isn't it? Fair trade that people would argue gives you a better deal, but I think you've got to recognise that America is actually, particularly under Obama, and I don't really mind who runs America. At the end of the day, they need to rebalance, they need to save more, and they need to become an exporting nation. Now, you're going to see Made in America as a as a product in the years ahead, with a lower dollar. They're going to be more competitive and they're going to need to grow their exports. And uh, so, so you, we're going to see a change, but it's going to be a few years off yet as they start to recover. Don't write them off yet. OK, thank you, gentlemen. Stand by. We'll come back. Coming up after the break, a body blow for 350 workers at Silverfern Farms as fire destroys a crucial meatworks plants in the Waikato during peak production. It won't be a very Merry Christmas for the local economy of Te Aroha. And the Reserve Bank gets ready to reveal its next move on the official cash rate. Will it be helpful or hurtful for farmers? But first, a question for you in our Farmers Facts and Figures quiz. How many litres of milk per day will Fonterra's proposed new milk powder plant in central Canterbury process when it begins operating in 2012? The answer when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Talks. Just before the break, we asked you, how many litres of milk per day will Fonterra's proposed new milk powder plant at Central Canterbury process when it begins operating in 2012? The answer? The Darfield plant will process up to 2.2 million litres of milk a day, equivalent to the production from 200 farms. Great news for dairy workers, but for those 350 men and women at the Silver Fern Farms Meatworks in Tiaroha, who watched their workplace go up in flames this week, it's been bad news for them and the meat industry. Chris, you got a feel for those people. Oh, it's pretty tough, you know, running into Christmas whenever you hear a, a story like this. And luckily, it sounds like some of the uh, the workers are going to be able to be relocated to, to other plants. Um, they're all getting a, a bit of pay, but for a lot of them, they're going to be taking home a lot less in December than that they were what they were planning on. And it comes at a very bad time. I mean, it is peak production for the business. Yeah, and luckily they uh, can can move quite a bit of stock around. I mean, I only know as much as everyone else that's been reading the newspaper and listening to the radio. But they'll they'll be shuffling a lot of uh, stock around to the other plants, I'd imagine, over the uh, over the coming months. Yeah, and Derek, sadly, uh, 350 people working there, but only 190 have jobs. Sounds fairly short term for now. That has a huge impact on a small economy, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But I think, you know, the, the bigger picture, I think, is the economy's got some, some rather bigger issues. You know, we're still borrowing a lot of money. Uh, the consumer is still not spending to anywhere near the degree that we need them to. Uh, it's but but a wait a minute, isn't that what we were told by the government to yeah. do, uh, button up your wallet? Yeah, I was just going to say that. You know, we're deleveraging, we're paying off debt, we're paying down our mortgage. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going through a tough time as everyone basically reduces their debt profile. Um, the government's sort of like shoring up that gap, if you like. But we got a warning shot from one of the rating agencies recently that we just can't keep doing that. Yeah, Standard and & uh, Poor's uh, uh, downgraded us. Uh, they haven't downgraded us. They've put it on negative credit watch. Oh, cor oh sorry, I stand corrected. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. So they're but saying that good. they might. They're saying that we're borrowing a bit too much and they're getting a bit worried about it. So, 
Uh, there's three rating agencies and uh, the other two have been quiet so far, so that's always a, a potential shot across the bows that uh, somebody could say something that upsets the markets. Uh, another interesting story that's come out recently that government-run businesses aren't doing very well. Uh, should they be getting out of some businesses and concentrating on doing the stuff that they do really well? Chris? Well, that's always a, uh, a, a big question for, uh, for New Zealand to get their head around. I mean, our government owns everything from, from banks through to, through to airlines. Um, and those, some of those businesses are going to uh, struggle in the recession just like if they were owned by, by private sectors. It's probably a, a question that's always going to be out there. Derek, are you telling us then that uh, we've got permission now to go to the malls and spend a little more? Is that the answer? No, I don't think it is the answer. I think the answer is to just keep doing what we're doing, to just basically reduce that debt profile, uh, to carry on paying it down. The government's got to do its part as well. Uh, and internationally, that's what's happening all around the world. The only countries really that, that are able to carry on spending are those that have big savings rates, and we just don't have that. Mm. Uh, we don't have a big savings rate in New Zealand, and uh, I mean, gee, the government's the biggest farm owner. Uh, in New Zealand. So, you know, with, um, with those sorts of issues in front of us, the, you know, we've got the Reserve Bank this week, they're, they're going to be uh, weighing these things up and I suspect that their, their comments are going to be fairly gloomy. And what are you picking for the official cash rate? Where's it going to go? Oh, well, no one's actually expecting any changes. So the market's now debating, you know, whether we're going to have no change through till March. Now it's maybe no change through till June. So people are putting out, pushing no change out for longer. We expect the Reserve Bank Governor to be trying to weigh all these issues up and, and he's going to be sitting on his hands and doing nothing until the picture becomes a lot clearer. And So no change to the, the, the shorter term interest rates for some time. But as Chris said before, the longer term interest rates are moving up and uh, you know US interest rates are going higher and uh, we're getting a bit of a rebalancing in that yield curve. Okay, so the pain continues for a little while longer. We're all in the same boat and get on with it. That's thank, it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks to my guests, ASB economist Chris Tennant-Brown and Derek Rankin, Director of Rankin Treasury Advisory. We'd love to hear your feedback, so drop me a line on the website and remember to check out my weekly blog. We'll give the last word to a veteran farmer who penned these words of wisdom from atop his trusted tractor. Take a look. Keep the faith. See you next time.